wish you could hear yourself, Charles. Jocelyn is turning you into a namby-pamby, wishy-washy poop squeak. But Jocelyn happens to be to be very cultured, uh, extremely civilized, and unbelievably sexy, okay? Now, the way I see it, being a poop squeak is a small price to pay for a woman like that. No! Listen, Charles, I like sexy women just as well as the next guy, but I'd never pay that price. Fifty bucks is about my limit. <laughs> I just wanted to let you know about my study group. Oh, don't be a funny daddy. I'll be your study buddy. I'm about to embark on one of the great challenges of my scientific career. This work right here is going to change history. I think this is going to be our greatest mission. I don't have time to study. I'll never get into Stanford. I got big plans for you tonight. I got maps. I got charts. I'm going to see you through this because my credibility is on the line. It's at this point that you'll want to start taking notes. Welcome to the Sitcom Study, the podcast where we contemplate the TV shows we grew up with and search for the truth and wisdom within the tropes and cliches. And Amy, what are we talking about today? Well, it's going to be your favorite episode ever. Pretty much. <laughs> this is our Charles in Charge mixtape. It's time for Oops All Charles in Charge. This is, <laughs> yes, our mixtape episode for uh, the Seaman, for the Charleston. <laughs> I, I don't know. <laughs> Normally, our format, of course, is we pick a sitcom trope, be it going to the prom or delivering a baby in an elevator, and we talk about four different sitcom episodes that involve that trope. And then once in a while, when we've covered the same show four different times over the year and a half we've been doing this, it's time to make our version of a clip show where we're going to pull all of the Charles in Charge segments from different podcasts and put them together into one glorious glorious package. That's right. It's super important to us as staunch conservatives to highlight Charles in the run up to the election. Yes. Just to be clear, uh, <laughs> we're having fun here. <laughs> Scott Bayo's off camera antics over the last 30 years or so are probably not the best. Uh, we need not get into the off camera antics of any of these people yeah. because I don't know that any of them are super great. But uh, yeah, Charles in Charge is, I'm on record as saying, it's one of my favorite shows ever, mostly because it was on in syndicated reruns or even syndicated first run because it's got kind of a weird history. When I was a young teenager, and, you know, we've talked all about how it's a family sitcom that forgets all about the parents and everybody else and just always focuses on the kids, yep. the kids that are in charge. Charles's charge or Charles and Buddy, who are themselves kids, they're college kids, right. you know, and so it's just very farcical and it's either total silliness with running around doing crazy stuff, having an invention that turns anything into a hot dog, <laughs> or it's like teen dating stuff. And right. so it just, for me as a, you know, 13, 14 year old kid watching this after school, it was like a slightly more credible version of Saved by the Bell. I was going to say, this was like right there at the same time. Yeah. It was like Saved by the Bell and Scott Bayo. Yeah. For some reason, this felt like more adult at that time yeah. than Saved by the Bell did, which of course is kind of silly looking back on it. But yeah, this really felt like this, this is the good stuff. You know, this is going to prepare me for being a proper teenager, <laughs> you know. And of course, Nicole Eckert. Yeah, well, it uh, goes without saying. Yeah. So yeah, we're going to watch these four, or rather, we're going to, you know, revisit our four previous Charles and Charge discussions, and we've also dug up a couple of trivia quizzes. That's right. We need to see how well Jay knows Charles yeah. and Charge, really. Well, you too. Uh, yeah. Well, we're, we're I'm gonna going ask to fail each other. miserably, and it's going to be fun. Jay is going to smoke us all. Let's break into these quizzes a little bit. I think we should do, I don't know. Do you want to go, do you want to be the asker or the, the ASCII first? Oh, I want to be the asker first. All right. So go ahead. Bring up uh, that first quiz. Okay. In the episode, The Naked Truth, mm -hmm. Charles's girlfriend is. She's a nude model, right? 
You are correct. It's a nude model. It says Charles is so upset when he finds out that his girlfriend is the nude model in his art class. Scott Bale also appeared in the role of Chachi Arcola in Happy Days and in the spinoff, Joni La... This is just like giving us facts yeah. about Scott yeah, this Bale. This is great. I mean, <laughs> we, we're familiar with the Scott Bale universe. We don't need all the extra <laughs> that's information. That's so nice of them to give us this random information that has nothing to do with this question. I was pretty confident in that one. In the episode, Mew Music, music, mayhem, Charles and the Powell children have a huge disagreement, and the children all side together against Charles. What is it that caused this argument? This, frankly, I mean, lots of them involved them banding together against Charles. Um, this music, music, mayhem title is not ringing a bell. You're going to have to give me the choices. Yeah. So a record player, a guitar, a drum set, or a cassette player. Yeah. Honestly, nothing about this He's sounds super familiar. Yeah. For some reason, none of their Charles doesn't play music. None of the no. none of the characters do in any regular basis. I could see a drum set being an issue. That wouldn't be totally outlandish, but I'm gonna go with the cassette recorder. For okay. some reason I feel like they're always talking about stuff like that. Yes, a cassette player. In this episode, Charles has a cassette recorder that he's using for dictation in class. The children one by one get a hold of the tape recorder and start recording each other's conversations, unbeknownst to anyone. Charles eventually finds the recorder and hears all all of the conversations the kids have had. He's furious at them for doing this and he sets out to teach them a valuable lesson about invading others' privacy. Yeah, just the kind of thing Charles would do makes perfect sense. Okay, so what is the name of the episode where Charles is accused of stealing from the Powells? <laughs> All right, that, we're definitely going to need you the need multiple the choice. Here for we that. go. Missing money, mm. the missing television, the hunt for the silverware, or a string of pearls. God, again, I've probably I've probably seen all of these titles on DVD menus in the early 2000s and then various streaming services over the years. I'm just going to say missing money. The the titles for Charles and Charge episodes are very simple. This was not one that's like, oh, we'll have each title be a spoof on a classic literature, you know. Right. So I think it's it's something like that. Okay. The missing money is Incorrect. The correct answer is a string of pearls. The children's old babysitter comes back for this one, oh, remember? Yes. And that and she like frames him because she wants to get her job back. Yeah. Yes. I do remember that. I think is she a famous actress or is that not one of she, the She I sort of have a vague recollection of her being someone Somebody. that we saw on other things and I yeah. now I don't remember. Okay. All right. Number four. In the episode, Seeing is Believing, Charles asks out a very pretty girl. While out on the date, what does Charles discover about her? She's blind. That she is blind. Ding, 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 ding. Yeah, that that one is a little on the nose with the title. (laughs) (laughs) Well, that's what you're expecting in the whatever missing money one. Yeah. We should also mention... I feel like, did Zach Morris date a blind woman or just a woman in a wheelchair? I feel like this is a surprisingly common thing. Maybe we need to add this to the trope list. He did. Yeah, I don't know. Dating dating somebody with a, you know, with a a difference or whatever. That would be an interesting trope to add. Okay. What are the names of the Powell children? Oh, come on. Um, The Powells, of course, are uh, in age... Eight, oldest to youngest, <laughs> Jamie, Sarah, and Adam. That's right. Now, for an extra bonus, the Pembroke children. Yes, of course. Are, um, well, the young boy was Jason, the older boy was Douglas, and the teenage girl, was it Liza? Lila. Lila. Lila, okay. yeah. yeah. Yep. Um, okay, and so, oh, this is fun. This is what it says. It does the same thing that you did from oldest to youngest, and then it says, Jamie was into fashion and looking good. Mm-hmm. Sarah yeah, was... Yeah, she was. <laughs> Sarah was into reading the environment self and self-expression. Mm-hmm. Adam was a practical joker. Yeah, that's putting it politely. <laughs> yeah. Okay, was that five? That's five. All right. I think you did great. You only missed one. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I would hope for 100% with Charles in charge, but, you know, life is short. What can you do? <laughs> 
All right. So, yeah, we're going to listen to the segment from the first time we ever talked about Charles in Charge. But interestingly, this is chronologically the latest Charles in Charge episode oh, yeah, we ever right. discussed. Hence, it's the silliest. Not that the others aren't silly with the UFOs no, and No, but all they that. definitely got sillier as time went on, for sure, as there were more and more uh, SVB joints, as we yes, came to exactly. call them. Scott Vincent Bayo got to direct uh, about half or so of these episodes. I feel like he was one of a couple or maybe three directors that would do these whole Especially seasons. Especially in the later seasons, yeah, there would be, I mean, he would do like half of them. Yeah, so yes, uh, I don't remember offhand if this is a Scott Vincent Bayo production. Or but if, if it is, you can guarantee that we will say it in the episode. Yeah, <laughs> definitely. So yes, this is from our Bonked on the Head New Personality podcast. This is about the Charles in Charge episode, Charles Split. <laughs> He's there just to take good care of me Like he's one of the family Charles in charge of our day Moving on to Charles in charge Here we go. I know you've been waiting. I'm physically giddy and nervous. I feel like I'm on a first date or something talking about Charles in charge. For the first time on the podcast, this is, of course, season four, episodes 14 and 15, Charles Splits. But just to, to sort of back up and give, give some general context here, uh, like you said, I think nostalgia-wise, Charles in Charge is my favorite sitcom. It's, you know, it's just what, for whatever twist of fate, I was watching, you know, from ages 12 to 14, 15, maybe... I was just in love with Nicole Eggert. I think, you know, her and Tiffany Amber Thiessen were like the two sort of queens of the the teenage heartthrobs at those times. But Nicole Eggert just, he just had a certain something. I think looking back on it, the way that the show has a spectrum of ages, like a lot of family sitcoms try to do. But I think this one just really got it right for me, having the parents be a total non-issue, having all of the plots be either about these teenage girls and their sort of dating mishaps or high school mishaps, or these two college guys and their foibles. Uh, all of that was just exactly what I wanted to consume at that time. And... Here's the part that's a little tricky. While he's not necessarily the most admirable person in real life, I think Scott Bayo just has this charisma and as this Charles character, I just really bought into this sense of like decency and coolness that he had where he can give you sage advice and he will tell you what the right thing is to do. But he's also just a cool guy and girls like him and he's got a lot of friends. I just he he was able to to sell that in a way that I just completely bought into and to an extent completely buy into now. And so I've seen every episode of Charles in Charge at least five times. We've watched them all together, you and me, within the first few months of our relationship. So yeah, I like this TV show. Yeah, he wooed me with Charles in charge. Uh, what <laughs> Unfortunately. about Unfortunately. So, yeah. So, Charles, um, I think you're right. He definitely is able to strike that balance as fictionalized as it is of the, like, I'm cool, but also I'm a, like a good guy. And this Chaz character is really fun because it's kind of like if Chachi grew up and turned into like a full asshole instead of kind of, you know, getting the... Uh, rough edges sanded off as it were yeah. by um by Joni. Um and so yeah, I think this is <laughs> watching Charles in charge with you is a joy because you're like a kid in a candy store. You get so excited. And so it's fun to watch a show with someone who's such a fan. Yeah. And so this one, right, Charles becoming Chaz again. When we're talking about, oh, let's do a podcast about all the silly sitcom tropes, like this jumps out immediately. 
And now that we're getting to, you know, the fourth of our four shows here, you can really kind of look back and say, these kind of stories sort of draw a line in the sand between your sitcoms that are trying to have some grounding in reality versus your sitcoms that are going to be a dopey little vaudeville act in the form of a family story absolutely and we got more and more of that type of like dopey silliness in charles in charge as the seasons went on and particularly when our friend scott vincent bayo was directing and this is a double episode uh svb joint as it were yeah he directed probably at least a third of the episodes after a certain point after like season three or four but so this episode starts with uh and i think this is maybe gonna be our sitcom study drinking game phrase uh gender roles right we get this whole premise is charles has this girlfriend that he's been seeing for a long time Charles and Charge love to pull this maneuver of starting a story with this girl that you've been dating for the last six months or whatever. Like he's always in this relationship that has been going on for a long time, even though we've never heard of this person when he was in a, he was with another girl the last time. Right. But yeah, this whole premise is Charles has this girlfriend who is sanding off his rough edges, as they say. And you know, the the sort of present example of this is they want to go to a movie. What movie are they going to go to? Well, of course, Charles wants to see the Dirty Harry Film Festival, right? But uh, no woman would ever want to see that. And when he's called out on it later, what movie did you end up seeing? Cinderella, right? Which no man could ever possibly want to see. I will just go on the record, sign me up any day for Cinderella over Dirty Harry. But yeah, this whole thing is like, this girl is a bummer, man. She's, you know, you're, you're domesticated. You're, you're not, you know, you're, you're not dangerous or I don't know. He's just kind of losing his edge because of this girl. Right. And I I mean, at first when we hear this, it's Buddy complaining about it. And so Charles in Charge, the premise of the show is Charles is a college student and his day job, like how he's putting himself through college, is that he's a nanny to these three kids, two teenage girls and like a tween boy. And he lives in their basement. And the mom also kind of stepped away from her role um, midway through the series because in real life, the actress got married and kind of didn't want to be an actress anymore, but they didn't let her go from the show. So she just had some random appearances here and there, but mostly was gone for the fourth and fifth seasons. And so they had Ellen Travolta, who plays Charles's mother and also played Chachi's mother in Happy Days. Um, They have Ellen Travolta come in and become a more prominent character as the mother of the children sort of fades out. And so we have the like older people dynamic of the grandfather, Walter, Charles's mom, Ellen Travolta, and then Charles and Buddy as the young people but not children and then you've got the three younger kids yeah ellen travolta is john travolta's sister uh she is the hammiest of the bunch by far oh, you she's really so see great she got her foot in the door those first few episodes oh let, let me on the show i'll be his mom it'll be nice so yeah you need someone and then she cranks it up to a thousand percent with her frantically pacing around the set but uh because of the shot you can only pace three steps so figure figure that out yeah she obviously was like let me go as big as i can yes um so so charles and buddy are having this conversation and buddy is explaining to charles all the ways that this girl jocelyn is no good for him and he's saying that like oh charles you know you're just like you're not yourself she's turning you into a namby pamby poop squeak yes so charles is like 
that's not true. You know, she just is making me a better version of myself. She wants me to be a little more cultured. And I, can, you know, I, I absolutely can be a little more cultured. We all could use that, right? So Jocelyn comes in and it seems like Buddy's just kind of being overboard, right? But then Adam comes home from school and he got beat up by a bully. Yeah, he's always being bullied. That's always this younger boy that's like 80% of the time. That's his story. So he comes in, he got beat up at school and Charles is going to talk to him like, okay, here's what you need to do the next time you come upon a bully. And he's faced with this conundrum because he wants to tell him, you know, you got to crack him in the skull, which by the way, based on your like initial take on Charles, wouldn't be something Charles would ever want to say to begin with. No, it's all, this whole story is uncomfortable and lame. I think that one of the most insidiously sexist tropes is this thing of the girlfriend or the wife as the sort of authority figure or the the person. Yeah, exactly. The sort of, you know, limiting factor. And so in this case, yeah, it's debatable. Look, this is the 80s, right? How do you stand up to a bully when, you know, it, it, there's there's not an easy, readily available question to what exactly is the right advice to give Adam in this case. But the way it's presented is Charles would like to say, if somebody starts with you, I think this is, again, sort of going back to Scott Bayo's kind of old school you know, uh, sort of tough but nice attitude. It's like if somebody starts with you and they're, you know, they're messing with you, then yeah, it's okay. Or even like it's what you should do to confront them and if necessary to strike back. And he feels like he can't say that. And every time he's about to say that, you know, she gives him this look and he kind of backs down. And yeah, the whole thing I, I just hate that trope of like a normal girl is like somebody that you have to like figure out how to trick or like circumvent or something. It's just a lame sort of stuff. Right. That you can't be yourself because no woman would like you that way. So you should fake it when you're with her. Yeah. And you have to go to lame movies because, you know, women don't like action movies. Right. Right. And so he tells Adam the kid you need to turn the other cheek and he's like well what if he hits the other cheek and he's like then you extend your hand in friendship and you know jocelyn smiles and nods like yes that's my good boy charles and buddy's like oh geez you know making fun of him and so then we cut to downstairs in the basement charles is you know apartment for all intents and purposes that's where he lives and he's trying to pick out what shirt he's going to wear for his hot date that night and Sarah and Jamie are downstairs talking to him and they're like you got to talk to Adam he went to school again today and got beat up and he did what you told him he turned the other cheek and he gave the guy gave him a shiner he's got a big black eye you need to go help Adam and he's like I don't know what to do. I can't tell him because Jocelyn doesn't want me to do that. And I don't know what to say to him. And I don't even know. And Jamie's like, well, I'm going to go get him because you got to talk to him because he's beside himself. He's got a black eye. And Sarah stays down there. And Charles is like, I can't deal with any of this. This is too much. And he's all like emotionally overwrought because he's torn between these two things. And he's like, I, I, I can't deal with any of this. I got to go change. Yeah. Well, he's already hinting at this idea yes. of a personality crisis. He's sort of in a rhetorical way going, look, my girlfriend wants me to be somebody. Buddy wants me to be somebody. You guys want me to be this person. I don't know who I am anymore. And he's sort of, it's one of those classic things of like, you know, I just wish I could dot, dot, dot. Well, and the last thing he says before he goes into the laundry room, which is off camera, is I've got to change. Yes. And so he goes into the laundry room to change his shirt. Yeah. which he he only ever has two buttons done on his shirt throughout part of the Scott Bayo season two look. on. Yeah. So he goes into the laundry room to change. We hear a thud and then he starts hopping back and forth in front of the doorway that we can see going ow, 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 ow. And we're meant to understand that he has banged his head. He comes back out and he's like, how you doing? Yeah. Don't you call me Charles. Nobody calls me Charles. I'm Chaz. Call me by my real name. The first thing he says when he sees Sarah in his room as he goes, this is a man's bedroom. Ain't you got no class? 
And so we are introduced to Chaz, right? Chaz is much more Italian than Charles. Very Italian, very like Jersey. Um, yeah. He's got the like- Use guys. Use guys. And um, anyway, so he's like, oh, what are these gross clothes? Yeah, well, like- well, no, what he says, I put this one down. I can't go looking like some fruitcake Count of Monte Cristo. And then he slaps Sarah's ass. And she's like, what the hell just happened? So there's a lot of instances in this episode of sort of adult things or what I would consider like pretty inappropriate stuff for a family show getting kind of semi-surreptitiously slipped in there. There's a time later when he mentions something like, oh, she can give me a valve job. And I was like, whoa, yes. Jesus. Like, there's little things like that that I'm like, okay, all but right. He was talking about the fact that the new girl he starts dating, Tiffany, lives with a bunch of motorcycle right. mechanics and knows how to fix well, a car. Okay. So he, it was a double entendre, but it, but he was in the process yeah. of describing that she knew how to work on cars. Right. That's what I mean. In that case, it's a little sneaky, but that's still like, that's a definite illusion. Oh yeah, but yeah, absolutely. Let's talk about the whole Tiffany aspect of this. In addition to Adam getting bullied, Charles has sort of been getting bullied by... Daniel Baldwin. That's right. Daniel Baldwin guest appears in this episode as Lyle the Lunkhead. And he is in jeans and a jean jacket. Before Charles is changed, right? When Charles is not Chaz, Charles and Jocelyn go on their date. And they go to his mom's restaurant, the Yesterday Cafe, which is set up to look like a a 50s diner, 60s diner. And there's this guy who looks an awful lot like a Baldwin. And we were like, which Baldwin is that? That's not Steven. Is that Billy? Because he's kind of like, you know, thick. But we were like, oh, well, at this time, Billy was still skinny. It's not Alec. Which one is it? Ah, it's Daniel Baldwin. Daniel Baldwin is a tough guy. And he's like, hey, you guys are sitting at my table. And that was like, he wasn't having it. And Charles was going to stand up to him. But Jocelyn gave him the look again, like, you can't do that. And so he was, he got soda poured on his hand as he extended it in friendship. And they ended up not getting their booth but the the guys what ended up hap- happening he was like oh i gotta get out of here anyway come on tiffany and she's like i'm sure here we go and they walked out ellen travolta she was like is there a problem here boys and charles was like no mom and he was like oh mommy and then they ended up leaving because he didn't want to embarrass him in front of his mother yeah charles gets razzed for being a mama's boy but then yeah so when he shows up again as Chaz, after his transformation, he just, he essentially breaks up with his his girlfriend, the nice girl, and walks over to those two, to Lyle and Tiffany, and slams down Daniel Baldwin with like a Vulcan neck, neck grip thing. Lyle is very easily subdued, right? If he's supposed to be like the neighborhood tough guy, all you have to do, Scott Bayo is like, a third of this guy's size. Oh, he's like Barney Rubble to his Fred Flintstone. All you have to do is grab this guy at a certain point in his neck. And like, it's almost physically awkward for them to portray this, you know, Scott Bayo holding him like this, but he's completely disabled. And Scott Bayo is basically like, hey, Tiffany, uh, you be, you're my girlfriend now. And he takes her and now they're together and they leave. Yeah. And this was super early on in Daniel Baldwin's career, right? This is uh, like his first television role was an episode this same year. This is 1989. Uh, He did an episode of Family Ties as a guest spot. And then he did um, Charles in Charge. Yeah. I think on Charles in Charge, they get him on the way up. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, you know? they definitely do. He like within that next year then went on and did was in like Born on the Fourth of July and like moved on to movies or whatever. But yeah, so basically, Chaz has fully taken over Charles's life and everyone is immediately alarmed, right? We have scenes with all the various characters immediately being alienated. The thing that is so interesting about where this story goes is that Chaz is strangely monogamous, right? Yes. He, his immediate agenda is, I need to marry Tiffany. 
I got to lock this girl down because she's so amazing. No wife of mine's going to work, honey. Yeah, we get that, that he doesn't want her to work, which, again, you know, all these shows are sexist as hell. But I thought that was such an odd plot twist. Like, I get that they don't want – it's it's something for everybody to be worried about. Like, no, don't get married. But it was just so interesting. Doesn't Chaz want to sow his wild oats? Why is his whole itinerary, I need to immediately marry this girl that I met a few minutes ago? I don't know. Maybe he felt like he's done that sowing his wild oats long enough. But he also, I think he explains in the valve job comment about why she's like the perfect woman. He kicks Jocelyn to the curb because she's too square. And he's like, hey, you're with me now, honey, to Tiffany. And they get together and everything's great. But she's apparently in beautician school. So she comes back to the Yesterday Cafe after um, she and Chaz Lamborghini, as he signs his marriage certificate, yeah. have gotten married. They go to the Justice of the Peace. He calls home. You know, they are married by a homeless tramp. Yes. Right? It's supposed to be like that they're getting married in a circumstance that's so like they're not just eloping. They're eloping in like the shabbiest little, you know, courthouse or whatever it's it's supposed to be. And so the guy is dressed like he's he's drunk. His clothes are all ripped. He's got like soot all over him. Like it's just. Yeah, he keeps very taking comical. swigs of something, you know, a bottle that's inside of a paper bag as he's doing it. He's got that like fake beard thing that, you know, when you were like dressing up like a hobo or whatever, yeah. you would put a beard like that on. But yeah, he and it, we we find out later on that he's a huckster. He is a con man and he's been arrested for, among other things, impersonating a justice of the peace. So the family has been freaking out because, well, first of all, they were trying to figure out how they can get this marriage annulled because they're hoping that real Charles is going to come back and he'll be horrified at everything that Chaz Lamborghini has done. Right. But we forgot to talk about how Chaz Lamborghini has a series of wife beaters that he wears underneath yes. his leather jacket. And they're all different colors. He keeps changing them throughout the ep like the two different episodes. And every single one of them is ripped in the exact same place right at the bottom of his sternum, like where you can see his diaphragm. So you can see his abs, even though Charles isn't wearing a button up shirt in this episode that's unbuttoned all the way down to kingdom come he's got a wife beater on that's cut all of the different colors it was like they laid them on top of each other and cut them in the exact same place it's so ridiculous yeah Chaz definitely has a signature look which is this one hole exactly dead center in the middle of his tank top so we find out that like they're trying to say that it, the marriage certificate is void because he signed Chaz Lamborghini. They find out that's not true. He right. can use whatever now, name he wants. Let's just pause on that for one second because they're saying Chaz Lamborghini isn't his real name. Of course, part of the fun of the lore of Charles in Charge is that he has no last name. It's one of those things like you can't tell what state Springfield is in on The Simpsons or something. So Chaz Lamborghini, they try to... Void the right. marriage the certificate because dead of that. End. Dead end. So then they say, okay, well, what are we going to do? And then they find out that the guy who married them was a con artist. So one of the things he was arrested for was impersonating a justice of the peace. So the marriage certificate is null and void. But before that happens, Tiffany goes back to the Yesterday Cafe and sits down with Ellen Travolta and is like, I got to get rid of your kid. You don't like me very much, do you? And she's like, I wouldn't say that. And and Tiffany's like, no, it's okay. But I'm better than your son. He's like a low life drifter. And I and he tells me that I can't work. And I'm the best manicurist on the East Coast. So I'm not giving up my career for him. So you got to help me get out of this marriage. And we get another Ellen Travolta making a meal out of no lines at all. Just like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm gonna, oh, I can't wait till this ends. Yeah. Yeah. So we have another example of the reverse bump on the head strategy. We haven't mentioned Buddy's uh, sort of long-term girlfriend throughout these later seasons is Nurse Bennett. And this is another thing that perfectly encapsulates the tone of the show. Nurse um, Bennett knows everything and she talks just like this. Yes, she's she's a very silly character. And it's it's perfect for him because 
Like you said, she wears a nurse outfit that looks like it's from a sex shop. And they call each other Nurse Bennett and Mr. Lembeck. Mr. Lembeck came in when his appendix burst. Like you said, Buddy is a parody of himself at this point. And so if you want to switch it up a little bit and give him, you know, a a long term girlfriend for a while, you know, you can't just have some girl and say, well, I guess she likes him. Like well, they, but they do that at other times. I guess so. But I like the way they created this whole crazy character and just, you know, like this cartoon character or like something at a Saturday Night Live and are like, let's have her be his girlfriend. And right. so she plays into the plots kind of the same way you're saying the professor does in in Gilligan's Island. You know, she's able to kind of throw in this, well, what I learned from medical school, blah, 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 and give us some crazy plot contrivance. Right. So she was like, oh, that will explain the lumps on his head. And Buddy's like, wait, explain it in non-medical terms for us. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. And so then Sarah recalls that he bumped his head and then Nurse Bennett is like, oh, well, if that's the case, then the solution is to bump him on the head again. So they we get a great scene where Jamie and Sarah and Buddy are in the kitchen talking about how they're going to set it up so one of them can hit Chaz on the head with this like rubber mallet and none of them want to do it. Um, And Buddy's like, it's simple. It's super simple. It's not going to really hurt him. It's not going to crack his skull because it's a rubber rubber mallet. It's just going to give him a, you know, a bump, which is what he needs. And he, he twice during this like precursor scene is gesturing with the rubber mallet and bangs it on the counter and it recoils back up and hits him in the face. But so they've got Charles sitting there and Buddy's telling this long rambling story that sounds like Groundhog Day, but is really like the story of Groundhog Day, but he's talking about moles instead of groundhogs. And um, the girls have a great scene behind Charles where they're trying, like Jamie goes to hit him. And I know baby Jay was drooling because this is a, we're in the fourth season of Charles in Charge now. So we're fully on Nicole Eggert is a sex symbol in real life and the costumes for her changed as that happened and so we've got her in this like midriff top that looks like overalls but only kind of goes to her ribs and then she's got these little like um, she's wearing a skirt that has like a V so it like dips down and you can see her belly button and she's standing behind Charles with her arms over her head like she's going to swing this mallet come down on his head and she is standing there frozen because she doesn't want to do it. And she del- she looks really hot. Yeah, Jamie's outfits have like a concept after a certain point. Like there's, she's like working with different designers from scene to scene. But uh, yeah, there's definitely, again, that, that aspect of vaudeville to this, that aspect of this, we're putting on a show for the studio audience and we're all trading turns with this mallet and stuff. But what ends up happening is... None of that is even necessary. Charles just bangs his head on the table. Well, no, they set it up because none of them can hit him. And so Jamie goes, buddy, why don't you come back here and I'll explain to Charles what you mean. And so then buddy comes around and he's got the mallet behind him and he's going to hit him and he can't do it either. And so then buddy comes back around to the side of Charles and he's like, look, it's ridiculous. You, you signed your marriage certificate, Chaz Lamborghini. That's not even your name. Who has a name like that? It's ridiculous or whatever. And Charles stands up and towers over Buddy and says, I happen to like my name. And Buddy goes, oh, well, I guess if that's the way you feel about it. And he throws the marriage license down on the ground. And so he bends down and Buddy moves the table over on top of him so that he'll hit his head when he stands back up. So it's, it's contrived. Sure. But he hits his head, you know, like we didn't see... And it happened off camera, the the strike to the head that started all this. But this does not look that dramatic. I, I mean, have you ever done the thing where well, you are well, up underneath something misjudging well, and whack what, the back of your head? That's what I wrote down. It hurts. It, if this is enough to change your personality, then I should have a different persona every time I come down to this studio because I'm constantly <laughs> whacking my head. But yeah. It works. You know, we don't have to do the uh, 10 times back and forth. Like on the Adams family, we get one bump to the head, 
self-inflicted as the result of the contrivance, like you said. And Charles is back to normal, breaks off everything, you know, his whole life is back to normal. But again, Buddy now becomes Lord Budley. And he's doing the Fred Flintstone thing, right? right? He's he's becoming a classy guy. Um, yeah, episode over. All right, we're back. Let's continue this quiz. So there's five more questions. Are you ready? Mm-hmm. What is Buddy Lembeck's full name? And he's schoolboy knows. <laughs> well, I don't know if he has a middle name that maybe I'm forgetting, but he's Budden Lembeck. That is correct. And it's very interesting, the spelling, because I would I was thinking it was like Budden's, like A-N-C-E at the end or oh, I-N-C-E no. I would have guessed it end. was like but inst with a T. Oh, no, I never heard a T, but it is. Are you ready for this? B U D D I N S. Buttons. Yeah. That, not buttons like we've been yeah. saying, but buttons. Well, but they do say buttons. I mean, I look, I have a feeling that I'm sure they wrote it some way in the script. We yeah. don't ever see it in print. No, in but the it's show. just so funny that we have taken it to mean buttons, yeah. as course, a, which is a very like highbrow buttons. But I think that's, that is the joke. I think that's the point, even if <laughs> they spell buttons. it that way. And of course, they don't reveal that. You know, they come up with that joke, you know, pretty deep into the show, I think. Yes, it was um, mentioned in the episode where Buddy's sister Bunny comes. Of course, played by Natalie from Facts of Life. That's right. All right, let's do it. It was a a very special episode about being an an alcoholic. alcoholic. Uh Yeah. Um, And that is definitely on our list for when we cover that trope. All right. Um, Okay, number seven is a write-in answer. Hmm. Which actor portrayed Buddy Lembeck? Oh, come on. Willie Ames, the (laughs) other. uh, Again, he he went on, of course, to be Bible Man. That's right. Uh, If you want to look up Willie Ames' latter-day career. Uh, yeah, but we, we, you know, celebrate his work as Buddy Lembeck in all of Charles and Chard. <laughs> all right. Number eight, which character said this quote? If one applies your head to one's ear, one will hear the noise of the sea. Well, that's what we call a buddy burn. That's that's when <laughs> Charles or Mr. Powell, occasionally the children, but usually it's Charles or Mr. Powell, they just have this endless supply of one-liners, yep. these insults to Buddy that the writers just, you know, dip Throw into the in. can, pull out pull out the index card. If and one so, applies your head to one's ear, one will hear the noise of the sea. Yeah, here's the thing. I don't think I don't think it's a grandpa one. Those are those tend to be a little more straightforward. I oh, feel like see, the, I do think this is a grandpa. I could one. tell the way you said that. Yeah. I feel like the sort of hoity toity uh academic phrasing of it, I'm gonna guess that's a Charles line. That's a Charles Byrne. All right, let's see which one of us is right. The answer is Charles. Of yeah. course you're correct. Charles said this to Buddy in one episode. Yeah, As okay. usual, Buddy always acted brainless. Thanks <laughs> for all the great information, funtrivia.com. <laughs> all right. Classic Buddy Burn. Classic Buddy Burn. Number nine. Here we go. What is the name of the college that Charles attends? It's, um, they live in Jersey. It's like, Copeland? That is correct. Copeland is the answer. And finally, how many episodes were there with the Powell family? With the Powell family. Okay. Well, I don't think I'm going to get it exactly right, but I think that there were five total seasons of Charles in Charge, four of which were with the the Powells. I'm going to say on average... This was, like we mentioned, this this was a network show for the Pembroke year, and then it was canceled, resurrected for syndication. So the syndication part makes it a little funky. Those tend to be not quite as standardized with their seasons. For the sake of easy math, I'm going to say there was, on, on average, 25 episodes per season. There was 100 episodes of the Powells. I think you're about as close as you can get without hitting it right on the nose. The answer is 103. 103. Okay. So they were closer to the full 26 per season yeah. thing. Yeah. Okay. So there were 103 episodes from 1987 to 1990. The episodes with Charles's first family, the Pembrokes, ran from 84 to 85. Mm. There okay. you go. Is that the last one? 
That's it. You did it. I think you only missed one, right? Yeah. Yeah. I think so. Nice job. Yeah. I'm pretty happy with myself. I'll flagellate myself for uh, that (laughs) that missing money or whatever. But okay. Let's listen now to the Charles in Charge segment from our Snowed In for Christmas episode. So I believe this is one of those ones that at the end sort of asserts that Santa Claus is probably real because right. they didn't know where That's the right. presents came from and all that. So yeah, this and was... we have we had various theories about whether or not it was Charles or it was Grandpa or yeah, who did it. There was it. a lot of comings and goings. Somebody's yeah. left behind. The rest of them I, go to the cabin. I, I feel like I was being a bit more like fanciful and magical and saying that it you know was really. Santa, and you were like, no, it was Charles. <laughs> well, yeah, we can, you can litigate all that as you listen to this segment. This is the Charles in Charge part from our Snowed In for Christmas podcast. And we're going to continue that in the next show, which is Charles in Charge. Jay, it's your favorite people. Yeah. It's season three, episode one, strangely enough, you'll laugh. Yeah, uh, we've talked about Charles in Charge before. This is officially my favorite sitcom of all time. It is not because it is good. It is uh, because it is mired in layers and layers of nostalgia for me. And, you know, we've we've talked before about how it was sort of a perfect delivery system for the kinds of just the kinds of sitcom stories that I wanted to watch at 12, 13, 14 years old when this was on in syndication. It was a family sitcom that managed to completely excise the adults from any meaningful role in in the stories. It combined, you know, just, just all those layers of Charles and Buddy dealing with their college stuff and then the daughters dealing with their, you know, high school teenager stuff. Uh, I was just, I was all ears of, with the wisdom that, that Charles in charge had to bestow on me. And I thought that Buddy was very funny. And so, <laughs> yes, I was big into Charles in charge. But this one, this is not a good episode, I would argue. Yeah, I think any of the episodes of Charles in Charge where they kind of get us out of the family, like out of that like one room that we kind of have the whole episodes, usually, like all the episodes usually take place in the living room and the kitchen in the Powell household. I think any time we sort of break out of that with Charles in Charge, it's not as good. Well, the problem I think is that There needs to be a farcical nature to the stories. That's the crux of Charles in Charge. If you know the the movie and the play Noise is Off, it's like that, but Charles is Mrs. Clackett, right? So he's (laughs) always got to be like in that main area on stage and everyone else is coming and going. Take the sardines, leave (laughs) the sardines, I don't know. Exactly, but it's like... Whether it's whether it's physically coming in or out or just the sort of situation, it's like he has to balance all these things going on and this person doesn't know about that thing happening and that person doesn't know about this thing and how can he keep that person satisfied and not mess up this other thing that's going on? And it's like him having to balance all these different things and that's the sort of appeal from it. And this episode kind of puts everybody together together Even though they're not literally all together, you know, we'll talk about how grandpa's left apart, but it just doesn't have that farcical quality to it. Well, the other thing that it it gets kind of wrong is, like you were saying, usually it's Charles trying to, like, manage too many things at once because he has all of these different kids that he's taking care of and also his own life. And in this episode, he has booked a cabin so they can all get away for Christmas. Yeah. And is like... Nobody really wants to go except Mrs. Powell. And Charles himself. Let's talk about this. What a bizarre premise. Like the the first lines of this episode are Charles explaining to Buddy, like, guess what? The Powells invited me and my mom to spend Christmas with them, which already stop right there. Now, everyone gets along well in the show and they all have a good relationship and that's great. But... 
He's saying that his employer family has asked his mom and him to spend Christmas with them like that. That doesn't seem already like something to get super excited about necessarily. And he goes, and then I had the idea to rent a cabin and they thought it was a good idea. So I did it. Right. And like we just need to kind of remember that this is Charles, who's supposed to be like a college sophomore. What does he know about renting a cabin in the mountains for the holidays? Well, later on, his mom is going to say wisdom, Charles, is defined as knowing whether or not to rent a cabin and you don't have wisdom. (laughs) Uh, So so there you go. But yeah, it's this bizarre scenario that's not that weird, but it's presented as like, hey, college buddy, isn't it cool that I get to spend Christmas with my mom and the the kids that I babysit? Like, is, isn't that awesome? Because this is in contrast to Buddy inviting him to spend Christmas in California doing Buddy stuff, right? right. Partying. And Going hanging surfing. With babes and yeah, whatnot. exactly. Yeah, and Charles is like, didn't you hear me, you idiot? <laughs> I'm spending Christmas with my mom and the Powells, you know, in a cabin, it's going to be so rustic and beautiful and cozy. Like he really has this sort of idyllic scene in mind of, you know, a fire in the fireplace and snowy yeah. in the mountains and everything. And we should say that if it weren't for the mauve and the beige, they already kind of live in a cold place that could have a fire and they could have Christmas right there. But they want wood walls, I guess. Yeah, I think they just want to be that much more removed. Like, they want to be out in nature. But yeah, most of them don't want to go. Jamie actively doesn't want to go because she's a teenager. She wants to hang out with her friends. Adam has sort of similar hangups. He's like, I want to be around my video games and stuff, right? Yeah, I want video games and television. Yeah, and even Charles's mom is like, Charles, we have our own family. Like, we're supposed to have Christmas with Aunt Pearl. Like, nobody wants to do it but Charles and the Powell's mom. This is one of the rare ones where she's even here. You know, right. we talked about how that actress, like, faced herself out of the show. So, yeah, it is this bizarre sort of unmotivated thing. And the way these early scenes play out reminded me of the Charlie Brown Thanksgiving special, which is sort of notoriously like the worst of those first few ones, because the conflict is just like, oh, uh, Franklin wants to come to dinner, but there might not be enough room. Let me call my grandma. Okay, my grandma said it's okay. Oh, there's... We're gonna have. We're supposed to have Thanksgiving here, but this other person wants me to have it there. Oh, okay. We can go to both. You know, it's like these weird little logistical hiccups that just get solved. Like there, there's all this dialogue devoted to like, well, if we take this car, then that person won't be able to go, and then someone else going, oh, well, what if I follow you in my car, and then and then so and so can give you a ride back, and then Buddy can go to the airport. Like it's almost like the Californians that SNL sketch. Yeah, there's just all of these logistics that's supposed to be the story. I think they were overdoing that scene for time or something. I mean, they needed a contrivance so that Buddy wound up at the cabin and missing his flight and that Grandpa wound up at home. That's what they needed. They needed a reason for that to happen. So they have this like real convoluted thing that you're talking about with, you know, there weren't, they all couldn't fit in one car with their luggage. So they, and the presents and the food, because they were bringing everything in because there wasn't a store there and there wasn't anything around. And so they were going to need to take two cars and they were going to follow each other up. But then something happens and Grandpa has to go to his work. And so he can't, go with them but then you know they don't want him driving up by himself or the mom going up by herself or something like that so it was like all right well we'll we'll send buddy up in his car with all the food and the family and the and the no no all the presents right no not even the presents the presents and the food and grandpa are what get stranded yes so the people and the clothes are all that go in the two cars originally yeah everybody ultimately gets stranded but it's just a question yeah they're separated from each other and exactly like you said we need this contrivance that buddy 
has plans of being in California, but is still with the main cast when they arrive at this cabin, which gives us total Kate Nally vibes from last week. This is the same situation. Charles, you dummy, you rented a cabin and it turned out to be a dump. Right. There's lots of problems with the cabin. There's two by fours and planks kind of covering holes in the walls. There's, um, you know, threadbare couches and ripped up chairs. There's no food. I mean, the ad said that there was enough canned food to last for three months or whatever. And it's all just uh, thousands of cans of canned mushrooms. So gross. Yes, this is going to be a recurring joke that's pretty funny, I think, that they only have mushrooms. So there's just all these all these different variations throughout the episode of like, all right, I guess it's time to roast the mushrooms on an open fire and stuff like that. Yeah. And so Charles, you know, from Jump, is usually in these episodes trying to be the one that um, is kind of keeping everybody happy and keeping everything together even though the things that are going wrong aren't his fault, right? In this episode, everything that's going wrong is his fault. And he's kind of a brat about it. He's like, all right, all right, I made a mistake. Everybody just calm down and let's pretend like it's not horrible and let's try to have a good time. Yeah, what's happening basically is the whole cast writ large is going through the same thing that Larry was going through in Perfect Strangers. Everyone has this notion in their head of what Christmas is. You know, Charles got this idea for this cabin, but everyone else is bummed because Buddy wants his California trip and Adam wants this and that. And And they don't have any food and now they're snowed in, right? So they get there and the snow starts getting really, really bad. And Buddy turns around to leave because that was going to be his thing that he was he was just dropping them off and he can't get down the drive he has to kind of immediately come back and then you know they realize oh man i guess we should start a fire because it's not very warm in here and oh we don't have any food and so people are getting more and more disappointed and then they realize if the road is closed closed and buddy can't get out that means grandpa can't get up and grandpa has the presents and the food so it's christmas eve and tomorrow morning they're not going to be able to open any presents and also they don't know how long they're going to be stranded because they don't have any food and so the mom tries to call the grandpa to say hey the road's closed don't even get on the road and the phone is dead yeah and meanwhile we have grandpa back home doing several of the one-sided phone calls like we were talking about he has to call you know the local the authority yeah <laughs> yeah like the the road authorities and stuff right like it's a lot like the scene in the shining i feel like where shelly duval is famously on the sort of old timey uh like circuit board or whatever talking to the guy about you know when the roads will be open and oh you know should somebody come check on us or whatever but grandpa has to just constantly be mugging and vamping on these one-sided phone calls, you know, talking to these these sassy authority people that we never get to hear. But there's a point where he says, what is this, dial a dunce? There's a point where he goes, oh, if you don't want to be a phone operator, you could have a great career working with a ventriloquist because you're a dummy. Like, he's just got this never-ending, you know, supply of these, like, burns and insults for for these imaginary people he's talking to. I was I did not get the ventriloquist joke when he said it because like the whole scene was just annoying and not very good and I, when he said the ventriloquist joke I was like is she throwing her voice? What is the operator doing? No, and it wasn't you until you just a said future working with a ventriloquist. And yes, it, the, that's the... now I get it because it's a dummy. Oh boy, <laughs> I'm a dummy. <laughs> yeah, but yeah, it is. It is a shining situation. The roads are closed. The phones are down, and Buddy starts to go Jack Torrance. They start having the jokes of Buddy carrying the axe and you know going crazy. Going Yes. Like, here's Buddy. Yep, that was a fun little moment because he, they've realized they don't have any food. Adam, the young son, is clinging to this paper bag and trying to sneak into the other room and everyone sort of sees him and they're like, what do you have in there? 
there. Turns out he has four candy bars. And so everyone's like, you have to share those. Like, we don't have any food. We're going to, you know, we're going to need them. And he's like, no, no, no. And then that's when Buddy does the thing with the axe and goes after him. And Adam, the actor who plays Adam, is cracking up and I guess they couldn't get a good take because the take that's in the show that we see is the character who plays Adam or the, the actor who plays Adam backing into the door frame of the kitchen and holding the bag in front of his face to hide the fact that he's laughing at Buddy going, here's Buddy and coming after him with an axe. He's supposed to be scared, but he can't yes. stop laughing. No, this is the Ed Wood production style. That is the mark of quality. <laughs> of Charles in charge. At some point, a bear shows up, right? Right, they have to throw the four candy bars to the bear so nobody even gets to eat them. Yeah, because the the cabin starts filling with smoke and Charles goes, there's nothing worse than smoke and opens the door to air it out and the bear comes there and he goes to toss the candy, but he tosses Adam out of the door and then, you know, that's a funny slapstick moment and they pull him back in. Yeah, so it's just more silliness. You know, this is... Kind of what I was hoping for with Perfect Strangers, you know, throw a bear in there. Why not? You know, <laughs> well, they threw a bear in the last Perfect Strangers, right? Yeah, um, that's true. So, yeah. So the the landlord has apparently uh, boarded up the chimney. And so Charles does eventually distract the bear enough to get outside, go up, take the board off the top of the chimney so they can have a fire and not fill the cabin with smoke. They all decide to, you know settle in and sit around the fire and everyone's complaining. Yeah. Jamie is mocking the notion of the Christmas mushrooms. Everyone's complaining about not being where they're supposed to be. Like they're all using that phrasing. And this is when we get the Das X sing along, right? <laughs> this is when we get Adam. This and time. Sarah. Yeah. Sarah yeah. starts playing the piano. Like, apropos of nothing, like, much like in the Mary Tyler Moore show, they're all sitting around sulking. Charles says, uh, like you alluded to before, he goes, yeah, maybe I don't maybe I don't fit in very well with this family. You know, just totally like, woe is me uh, when, yeah, it is kind of his fault. Yeah, and, well, uh, and you see Sarah, like when everybody's complaining, you know, they kind of do a camera shot on each person as they're complaining about whatever. And then they take a shot of Sarah and Adam. Sarah's sitting at the piano, Adam's standing by the piano, and she sort of like nudges him and then turns around and then it goes back to more people complaining. Well, Sarah is definitely the Linus of Charles yes. in Charge, so it would make sense for her to sort of take that role. Yeah. And so she starts playing Silent Night and then Adam in his little angelic cherubic voice is Silent Night. Yeah. Now, Night. I don't think that this is intended to be like the Mary Tyler Moore show, a we're not playing the characters anymore type thing but it it might as well be because there is no way having watched every episode of charles in charge multiple times now that this character of this little boy would ever in a million years spontaneously start singing silent night to like make his family feel better right? no but sarah would yeah I and can i believe think that. she's the kind of the ringleader here so that's and again i don't think he would go along with it i think he, he would say you're on wouldn't. your own no you're right but again this is another one of these like somebody is going to bring back the the Christmas spirit somehow somebody's going to remind this grumpy group of people that it's you know that there is something redeemable about being together and it's the holiday and so they sing and then somebody reminds them about Jesus and they decide to go to bed they go to sleep and I guess we get the acknowledgement that Santa is real. Right. right. This is the magic of Christmas, right? So Adam is sleeping on the couch in the main room by the Christmas tree that Charles has gone out and cut for them. Yeah, we get a spoof of the Waltons before this. We get the good night, Charles. Good night, Sarah. Good night, Jamie. Good night, buddy. And yes. then, yeah, this. That goes out to a commercial, right? And then comes back and it's the middle of the night. And earlier in the episode... Adam says to his mom, Jamie and Sarah just told me about some last minute presents. So we wanted to let you know, we added a few things to our, our Christmas list. Here you go. And he lists off these three things. And the mom says, 
Adam, we're getting in the car in 15 minutes. Like, there's no time to go buy those. I'm sorry. And he was like, okay, well, I just thought I'd tell you. And so we see this, you know, Santa Claus, this man in a Santa suit kind of bent over, stoking the fire. Adam sort of wakes up groggily and is like, oh, hey, Grandpa, and then goes back to sleep. Yes. And um, then the next morning, Grandpa's actually there. He shows up. Uh, yeah, Grandpa explains, like, the, the roads have reopened, and, you know, it was a tough journey, but but here I am. I just got here, right? Yeah. And he wakes Adam up from having just walked in. And so we're meant to understand that Grandpa didn't get there until, that, until the morning, so whoever that Santa Claus person was overnight must have been the real Santa Claus. Well... But so as to this sort of magical realism Santa Claus thing, here's the thing. I don't want to I don't want to give them too much credit here, but I think it's laid out with this ambiguity that we have all the evidence to believe that this was Charles, right? Because when when grandpa comes the next morning, Adam says, oh, grandpa put them. I saw them. I saw him do it last night. He was dressed up like Santa and he gave us these presents. And Charles goes, no, Adam, grandpa's Santa suit is in his suitcase in my closet. Right. And we've established, I think, that Charles is abreast of these Christmas wishes, or at the very least, he could have come across this list. And Charles is the only one that doesn't get a present. Buddy and the kids all get these mysterious presents from quote unquote Santa Claus. And Charles is the one that says when Buddy says like, what's the deal here? What the hell happened? Charles says it was a Christmas miracle, right? So I think all of those building blocks are there for you to believe like th- this was Charles. He what did this. What the hell are you talking and about? Didn't tell anybody. All of the building blocks are there for you to believe that it is Santa, not well, Charles. No, but that too, because Despite, because the mom says, I don't have wrapping paper like that. Well, but again, but Charles could have his own wrapping paper. And he, then why didn't his mom get a Santa Claus present? Well, that's a good question. And also, having watched it a, a second time, I'm almost positive that the actor who they have in the Santa outfit is neither Charles nor Grandpa. It is a random dude that is is cast as Santa. Of course uh, it is. So that that would uh you know <laughs> that would affirm what that What rabbit hole did you go down to make you start to think that we were trying that they were trying to set us up to think that it was Charles. Do the, you just like Scott Bayo that much? No, it is because I started thinking that when he was the only one that didn't get a present and again the line about grandpa's grandpa's santa suit is in my closet and to me it was the sort of thing like hiding in plain sight like bruce willis in the sixth sense like oh it's right there he says i have the santa suit i'm the only one that did get that didn't get the presents and i'm the one that's gonna say don't worry about it it's a christmas miracle don't ask any more questions okay now i want to go back and watch what was going on in the background when Adam was reading off that Christmas list? Because I feel like there was another part in this episode where Charles was a little bit late to something because he was like, oh, I just had to go get a a couple more gifts. This is like Clue, like Mrs. Peacock wasn't in the kitchen. And I think you were picking up on something that I like brushed right over just in like, of course they were making us think it was Santa Claus. But now... Do I have to go watch Charles in Charge what, again to see whether or not you have picked up something that I did not even clock? If if we watch it again and they make a point of Adam sharing the Christmas wishes with Charles, I think it's sort of undeniable that not necessarily that he is Santa, but that they're laying out. We have two a Charles Christmas mystery to yeah. go solve. <laughs> yeah, I'll watch it for a third time in, in two days. And you'll love it. But yeah, so in terms of tracking the tropes, I think this is a very close overlap. We get the Christmas is where you find it. Family is where you find it. All that matters is that you're with the people you care about. And we throw in that extra overlapping trope of solve the conflict by singing, right? A child or a middle-aged woman with a squeaky voice and and you're good to go. I 
when we get into an argument this holiday season, which we are absolutely going to do because holidays always are stressful times, I am going to stop in the middle of the argument and just start singing Silent Night. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I will sing Three French Hens. Because <laughs> you will be grumpy. Moving on to Rosen. Okay, that was from our Snowden for Christmas podcast. We're going to move on to the makeovers, but first we're switching the tables. Uh, I'm going to ask you questions from this Charles in Charge quiz. And, you know, if, if you don't have the answer, then we'll sort of attack it together. Okay. Okay, here we go. This has pretty much already been covered. Charles in Charge was an American sitcom debuting in the 80s and 90s, and basically Charles was a sitter for three children. This is formatted like the questions in 21 on Quizzer. Yeah. <laughs> what were their names? Um, well, we're so... We're just talking about debut season. Debut season? Mm -hmm. um, you just said them. So I think it's Lila and Douglas and Jason. Yeah. Actually, as I'm reading this through, that's correct, of course. But if you did the full multiple choice, it's it's going A, Lila Douglas, Jason, B, Jamie, Sarah, Adam, C, both. The first three were on the first season and the last three were the children from the other season. <laughs> and obviously that is the one that's correct. Yes, obviously, because we have all of the names. Okay. Now this one, obviously, you know the answer to. I'm going to read you the choices for fun. Who was the famous, cute, dark-haired actor that played <laughs> Charles? A, Vince Vaughn. <laughs> B, Scott Bayo. C, Jason Priestley. D, Freddie Prinze Jr. Or E, Ryan Gosling. Now, this is really got a showing wide you... wide age Well, that's the thing. Here. This is showing you the age of the person who made this quiz because they could not come up with a single uh, option that is really contemporaneous right, with, Scott, with Bayo. Scott Bayo. Priestley and Vince Vaughn. Like, Priestley is the closest. But Charles... Uh, yeah, I Scott would say, Bayo, like, Vince Vaughn is probably the closest He's the in closest age, in age, but, but he, he was not famous, famous until, until Swingers. Later. Yeah. Yeah, in the late 90s. And so Scott Bayo was so far in front of these. And it's so funny that, like, Justin Bateman, Michael J. Fox, like, nobody can I think know. of that. They're, oh, they're giving right. us Ryan Gosling <laughs> as a choice. <laughs> Who was, who's our age? Yeah, and was he like was a, a child. Baby. Yeah, he was like on. me watching this crushing on Nicole Eggert, <laughs> exactly. dreaming of joining the Mickey Mouse Club. Well, he probably, at that point, I think he already was in the yeah. Mickey Mouse Club. Uh, yeah. So your answer, of course, is... Is Scott Bayo? Yeah. Number three, on the first season, the family was the Pembroke family. What was the last name? I'm glad that I answered the questions first because <laughs> this is like a total bust. On the first season, the family was the Pembroke family. What was the last name of the second family Charles was in charge of in the rest of the season? That's the Powell family. These are much easier than the ones you had. Yeah. I I'm think feeling they might like get a harder. champion. <laughs> but here, I'm, I'm going to make them harder. Do you remember... Uh, the first names of the the adults in the Powell family, Grandpa and the mom. In the Powell family? I mm -hmm. thought you were going to ask about the Pembroke. In the Powell family, it's Walter is the grandpa. Um, I don't remember the mom's name because she was not yeah, around very neither much. Neither do I. <laughs> Honestly, that was a bluff. <laughs> I don't remember her name either. All right, here's a pretty straightforward one. What year did the second season begin oh that and there was, are choices of yeah course. we just talked about that right because so they were off the air for like two seasons so it was 84 to 85 and then they didn't do um 85 86 and so 87 was the beginning of the second season that is correct <laughs> and number five this is an interesting one Dave Kurtz, Michael Jacobs, and who else constructed the theme song to this show? I've never heard the word constructed used to describe creating music. Hint, he is also the executive producer. So this isn't one that I think you could just rattle off the name, but if you see the choices, most of them are either joke choices or like for stupid people. Right. Like I'm looking at the choices. So it looks like Mitchell Banks and Al Burton are the only real options here because the others are R.L. Stein. I mean, look, when Goose you find Bumps out author. that Chuck Lorre is actually the composer of the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles theme song. <laughs> I mean, not... anything is possible, right? Yeah, maybe. Maybe R.L. Stein Maybe. dabbled <laughs> Before in... Before he started writing all the Goosebumps books, he's like, oh, let me write this theme song. Yeah. Um, my guess is going to be Al Burton. Yeah. Um, though I didn't even say the choices. The choices are A, Mitchell Banks, B, R.L. Stein, C, 
Warner Brothers, <laughs> D. Al Burton, and E. Tim Burton. Yes. So Al Burton is my guess. Yes. Al Burton is correct. Hey, Tim Burton. it was a 50-50 choice between yeah. Mitchell Banks and Al Burton because the rest were jokes. Yeah. Tim Burton would have been, I think, in between Beetlejuice and Batman at this point. He would take out the time to... Uh, to write the Charles and Charge theme song. Okay. Absolutely. That's five questions. We'll finish off the next five in a few minutes. But first, let's revisit the Charles and Charge segment from our Makeovers episode. We this, get to see the Pembrokes. Yep. This is from season one. You'll hear all about it. This is from the podcast all about Makeovers. The new boy in the neighborhood lives downstairs and so, you know, I guess we'll see how this trope evolves. As we move on to Charles in Charge. We're looking at A Date with Enid. Yeah, so we've covered Charles in Charge a couple times before, and we've talked about how it is sort of my favorite sitcom ever, even though it's pretty dumb. But this is season one, Charles in Charge, which is a horse of a different color. Right? It is There's... a very, I mean, it feels different. It's a whole different show, you yeah. know? The only other example like this that really comes to mind is Saved by the Bell, which started off as Good Morning, Miss Bliss, had a different cast and took place in Indiana instead of California. And in both cases, they underwent a major overhaul. In the case of Saved by the Bell, they changed the actual name of it. As far as Charles in Charge, what happened was this was, I think, a network show for one year that got canceled and then revived for syndication. And they changed the family which Charles worked for. And basically the whole cast that surrounded Charles and Buddy was swapped out for a new family. And those are the characters that most people remember from Charles in Charge because that's seasons two through five. Right. So that's Nicole Eggert and all of them. They went from a brunette family to a blonde family. Right. This first season of Charles in Charge has this original family that they eventually got rid of and has Charles himself as more of a nerdy sort of buttoned up character. He just looks a little bit different. And, you know, that was one of the things that they changed when they retooled it for the syndication was Scott Bayo said, uh, let me dress more like I did when I was Chachi. Let me wear my, my unbuttoned shirts and have long hair and just be more of a cool guy. Yeah. And it also what surprised me, and I didn't realize this until well after we'd watched all of them, was that not only did it get canceled and then come back as a completely different show, but it took a whole season off. Yeah. It wasn't contiguous. So the age difference between Buddy and Charles in season one versus Buddy and Charles in season two is just... It's no, it's staggering. noticeable. And that is why when I was a kid first watching these shows, and that's why I'm so nostalgic about it because I would watch it after school, I didn't like when these season one episodes came out because Charles looked weird. You know, like I said, he dressed differently. And yeah, like you're saying, he just looked younger and the whole vibe of it was different. And so in those days, I was just, it was like when a Miss Bliss episode came on with Saved by the Bell. You were just like, ah, damn it. All right. I guess I'll watch DuckTales instead. <laughs> and so I think... Which is hilarious because I loved the Miss Bliss episodes of Saved by the Bell because I was such a fan of The Parent Trap. And it was so cool sure. to see Haley Mills, all grown up, playing this teacher... Yeah, well, and what we discovered with Charles in Charge watching it together more recently is that the season one episodes are fine. Like, in oh, some ways, they're better. Yeah, if I mean, I think in the perfect world, for me, would be a mix of the season one cast and the later cast. Because yeah. I think Sarah and Jamie in the later cast are wonderful. I think the youngest brother, the littlest brother in the season one cast is amazing. If he could have stayed on and somehow been adopted by the new family that would have been yes. fabulous and the middle brother who this episode we're going to talk about is going to focus on i like him too but yeah of course the main reason why i preferred seasons two through five charles in charge was because it had the teenage girls you know especially nicole eggert this has lila we'll get into her but yeah season one charles in charge is a little different but the premise is the same he's charles he's in charge he's the live-in babysitter to this family right 
in season one, we have a more straightforward nuclear family, a mom and dad and three kids. You know, in, in the later seasons, we get into the thing with their dad being stationed in the South China Sea or whatever, and they live with their grandpa. So this episode begins with Charles in his bed, like basically asleep. And the the cast members start, you know, kind of knocking on the door and coming in one by one. And already you get that Charles in charge farce energy, yes. you know, that it's not always great at it, but that is part of the DNA of Charles in charge that sort of noises off people coming in and out. And sometimes a scene will go on for a long time and have a lot of just like, you know, running around the stage and different people doing different stuff and that kind of like stage farce energy. Yeah, this episode was better than in this season one episode is better than a lot of the episodes yep. that have happen in seasons two and beyond. Um, but yeah, it's a lot of fun. Everybody has a good time in this. And um, you get the f first person that comes in, like you said, is the dad. And he's like, all right, you're gonna, Charles, you're gonna get a taste of what it looks like to be a Pembroke on a rainy Sunday. And he's got this checklist in his hand. And he's like, here's everything that's happening today. And then the next one that walks in is the youngest son. And he's singing this Pizza, yeah, he wants Playland to to pizza song, Playland. and it's it's just like an earworm that keeps going and going, and it sets the tone for the whole episode. So the dad's listing off all the things that need to happen. Charles isn't even awake yet, but he just is like, uh, kind of responding. And then the oldest sister, Lila, comes in and she's like, hey, my friend Enid is coming over today. Don't be weird. I know she's a little strange, but we're studying and everybody just leave her be. And and that's her pr announcement of what's happening with her today. And then the mom comes in because she's got to go and review a movie f for no reason because every critic has already reviewed it and they already hate it. Yeah, this is a weird storyline. I guess the mom is a film critic. I feel like this is one of those like every few episodes they change what she does but yeah she's a film critic well the whole reason they're doing this is to have this parallel uh, idea course. with the makeover story yes. about liking a thing that nobody else likes right this it's is very what they're silly. trying to set up yeah. It doesn't work at all, but it's what they're trying to say. Yeah, her issue is, oh, I have to review this movie, but it's a lose-lose proposition for me because everybody doesn't like it. So why even bother reviewing it? Because I'm going to either be piling on to the, the hatred of this movie or I'm going to be, you know, seen as an idiot, basically. Because I'll be the only one who likes it. Yep. Right. But that's her story. The first big scene we get after, you know, the open in Charles's bedroom is Charles and Douglas, who is the middle kid. He's he's 11 or 12, and uh, he's a weirdo. That's his thing. He's into science fiction and comic books, and he likes to wear his weird, like, Mac and me alien mask around the house and stuff like that. And so as he's sort of following Charles around the house, he's giving this little speech about, well, you know, Charles, I've always been fascinated by the bizarre, intrigued by the unique, uh, attracted to the unusual, you know, and this is Ding all, dong. <laughs> yeah, this is all building up to Charles opening the door for Lila's friend Enid. And she's revealed to be weird, basically just because she's buttoned up in a raincoat. Well, yeah, and it's a brown raincoat, so she looks like a turd. Yeah. Like which, a wet turd standing in their doorway. Yeah, but it is a funny thing. Like, she could be Marilyn Monroe under that for all we know. Like, the only thing that's strange about her at a glance is just that she's all buttoned up in this raincoat and sort of standing in this weird posture, you know, when they open it. So it's kind of like a laugh line. But then she comes in and, you know, they they unveil her. And yeah, you know, usual story, glasses, Hair tied back, no makeup, you know, just the usual, again, quote unquote, ugly duckling who is just a totally normal person wearing glasses. Right. I mean, we see it just from from jump, though, even when she looks like a, you know, standing turd in the doorway um douglas is like a you know a gog He's oh like, yeah oh, no she's he, amazing yes and then he can't even speak as she takes off her raincoat and charles shows her upstairs to lila's room and then we find out that the real reason she's here isn't to study it's because she has been curious about her friend 
Lila and all the pretty girls at school and how they know how to do what they know how to do, which is like do their hair and dress in pretty colors and wear makeup. And that's when she has the line where she's like, well, you know, what if I take my glasses off and let my hair down and I'm not beautiful like they are in the movies? Yeah. So this one explicitly acknowledges this as a trope. They're like, oh, there's always this part in movies where the girl takes down their hair. So they're trying to be a little postmodern with it. And yeah, this this is, again, a, a totally voluntary makeover. This is somebody, you know, seeking out this assistance. We don't have the specific inciting incident like Ralph, where it's like, right. oh, I was rejected by this particular person. But it's the same deal. I want to be more girly. I want I want boys to like me. Well, but no, that's that's the difference in this one. She isn't doing this because she wants any external validation. She's doing it because she wants to know if it is something that Mm. is part of her personality that she just just hasn't learned how to do yet. Fair enough. And so she is, it's all about her. She's like, I want to know what it feels like. I uh, can, can I look pretty if I put on makeup? If somebody taught me how to do makeup, you know, in my mind, if I was playing this character or if, you know, I, I like in my mind, her backstory is that, you know, her mom is dead and she has a, you know, she only has a dad and her dad's like a professor. And yeah, so she's like, say, super, a scientist yeah, of some kind. so she's like super into these, like, you know, sciencey kind of nerdy things and has just not been exposed well, to that sort of like feminine experiences. Yeah. She also mentions liking horror horses at some point which i just had to laugh because that's a tina thing from bob's burgers right. and she i feel likes like to read tina, her horse books yeah tina and this girl definitely kind of have a similar vibe absolutely uh, but yeah lila also says at some point once you're beautiful you won't need that imagination anymore which oh I god i like, know which Jesus. is horrible yeah again this is sort of i feel like what we're talking about with the mixed messaging where it's like are are we the audience supposed to be on board with this or are we supposed to be sort of seeing the error of their ways as teenagers. I also just wanted to throw out there, if Lila is the one orchestrating this whole makeover and how to be more of a, you know, fashionista, physician heal thyself, right? Like, Aww, Lila... come on, she's cute. <laughs> I mean, I, I, yeah, I think that the actress is cute, but it's funny how she dresses basically like she's the daughter of Al Borland and she doesn't have a mom. Like, she's wearing head to toe... <laughs> so she should be your, like, ultimate. <laughs> <laughs> she's wearing head to toe flannel and denim, right? It's, it's blue jeans with a blue denim vest and then blue flannel so she just looks to me like like a hiking trail guide or like brad from hey dude or something like i don't know about that i thought she looked pretty hip i mean yes her clothes were warm but it wasn't like she was wearing a canadian tuxedo or something i thought she was very close to that so regardless i would not be throwing shade at all except for the fact that the whole episode is about her you know sort of sharing her expert fashion knowledge and i thought it was kind of funny that like she is is you know to me she could use a little bit of a makeover herself <laughs> well and i feel like it was more like expert hair and makeup knowledge sure. and then that all comes crashing down right because she tries to tame this girl's hair and it turns into some weird sort of sculpture on her head yeah she looks a little bit like one of the guys in mc hammer's entourage back in the early 90s who would have this like hershey kiss shaped like afro thing or like a a dr seuss character yeah somebody from the hunger games that's what she looks like it's like she's wearing a sculpture on her head just from moose or whatever and so then the family gets called into the room after you know we have this establishment that douglas is super into enid and he's trying to like talk to charles and talk to his dad to figure out how he can ask her out and you know let this girl enid know that he's interested in her and then lila's like help help everybody come help and so the family goes running into the bedroom to find out what what help is needed and they see that 
this isn't a study session, that it's a makeover session, and Douglas is crushed. Yeah, he's very uh, straightforward about his desire to go on a date with this girl, like at least to his family. He doesn't have any embarrassment about that. He's just like, I am in love. I want to go on my first date today. Let's make it happen. So yeah, the, the makeover goes sideways the first time around. Now, how do they fix it? They end up putting her in the shower. It takes, they think they said like three or four shampoos to get it back to normal or somewhere resembling normal. And then before she makes her big reveal where she comes down and she has had the makeover that was successful, Lila says, it, you know, we tried mousse and that didn't work. We tried hairspray and that didn't work. And we tried makeup and that didn't work. And what we realized is that Enid doesn't need any of those things. She just needed to brush. She just needed to brush her hair and a little bit of clothes or something. Yeah. And here she comes. So it was like the, they were trying in this sort of weird, awkward speech to tell us that she did have the experience of taking her glasses off and taking her hair down and being beautiful. Yes, this, this is so strange because it's like... Yes, she did need a makeover, but not the exact makeover we thought. We thought we needed to give her makeup and a lot of mousse, but actually we needed to give her new clothes and change her hair and take off her glasses. Like, we still get this changed version. Right. No ponytail, no glasses. Right. What we get is more colorful clothes right. and, like, nice, you know, like, less frizzy hair and... I don't know, just like a sort of sunnier attitude and like more confident body language. But it is this weird hybrid of you were beautiful all along. You didn't have to do anything with. No, we did still need to change some things. Right. But the the weirdness continues for me when what happens is Enid herself is delighted to have been made over and is like, this is great. This is the new me. She goes on her date with Douglas in the kitchen, right? right. They've made a Orange date. Orange juice and cookies or something. Orange juice and conversation, oh, I believe, my bad. <laughs> was, was what was on the agenda. So she goes in to have her date with Douglas. They have like five seconds pass and she comes back out and she's like, all right, see ya. And then they go in to talk to Douglas and it's revealed he doesn't like the new Enid. He liked her when she was weird. Right. And this is where I'm like really on the edge of my seat as to like, what are they going to say about this? Like, what message are they trying to convey? Because a lot of what they're saying is like, oh, she was a caterpillar that needed to turn into a butterfly. Like they start veering in the direction of... It was immature of you, Douglas, to like her when she was weird. Like, she was right to change. And now it's only a matter of time before you grow up a little bit and realize that women should wear bright, colorful clothing and not have glasses and be pretty. <laughs> no, that is basically what they end up doing because they can't seem to pick a lane, right? So Enid leaves and Douglas comes out and he's like, enraged at Lila and he's like you ruined her she was perfect before and now she's this thing with these neon clothes and Lila's like she's happy and boys will like her which is kind of you know her story about it and then Charles tries to explain it you know through the caterpillar pillar and butterfly metaphor being like oh you know you like caterpillars better than you like butterflies well one day you know you might change your mind and so it becomes this like instead of being about Enid and her makeover as having anything to do with anything that just becomes this side note because it was her choice and she likes herself this way whether or not boys like her because she yeah. wasn't put out at all by the fact that this boy didn't like her like I said before, it was about her yeah, wanting to... She didn't to, know this boy existed prior to Well, and to she didn't thing. even care, right? Yeah. This isn't about the external motivation. This is about her internal motivation. So then it becomes this, like, coming-of-age moment for Douglas, who, once he gets older, they're telling him he's going to, like, 
women who look more yeah. put together. Now, eventually, it's the mom who sort of puts us back on the right course, I think, because the whole family is together again. You know, all the while, we've, we've been having this caulking B story where Jason, the boy, is caulking everything, which is... Really apropos of nothing, but I just love it. You just get it. to have the fun physical comedy of the cock going everywhere. And it's just such a quintessential B story to me. Like, just such a perfect, like, it knows exactly what it is. You have this little kid spray cock. cement dumping into the full house kitchen. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. But so, yeah, so the whole family is back together again, and... It's the mom who, like you said at the beginning, sort of gets on the same page with Douglas and is like, no, actually, you're fine to like what you like. Like, never mind all of that. Like, if you like weird girls in raincoats and glasses, then then you're all set. And I'm going to go write my movie review where I say that I like this movie, even if everybody else doesn't like it. Like, she finally sort of gets us on the path of like, oh, right, it's a sitcom. We need to tell people that, you know, you can like what you like and it's okay. Yeah, so we had to have that weird little story. But this is the, the issue that I have with this episode is that it like goes in this direction, then it goes in that direction, and then it goes in this direction. And I, as a as an adult, am confused about what it's trying to teach me. Yeah. As a child, I pff, nope, that whole episode would have been about the cock. Yeah, no. And That's it, what she said. <laughs> <laughs> it goes back to kind of what we were saying, where in Green Acres, they don't even really bother having a lesson because it's like, oh, it's just silly and they're grownups anyway, so whatever. And then in Charles in Charge, it's like they sort of know that they should try to have some kind of messaging, but it's like they're doing their homework five minutes before class and they just can't bother to like nail it down and get it right. And so we get that. Right. But yeah, good stuff. Always, <laughs> always a fun time with Charles. Also, much less Buddy in this episode. Just something to note. Season one, Charles has Buddy just pops in here and there. He doesn't become, you know, the main Yeah, state. we have, there's kind of off and on episodes of the Buddy and Gwendolyn right. and Charles kind of college focused stories, young, you know, cool college kid focused stories. And then the family stories. And right. this one was an all-family story. Right. It wasn't yet part of the DNA of the show that Charles and Buddy are these funny bosom buddies that get yeah. into crazy situations. Okay. Moving on to iCarly. Charles in charge of our wrongs and our rights. All right. That was from our Makeovers, uh, that was from our makeovers podcast. We're going to finish up with our UFO sightings segment. But first... We'll finish up this quiz. So, Amy, who was Charles... Sorry, why was Charles working as a babysitter to begin with? Um, this is one that the choices would definitely help, but if you want to just go in cold, by all means. Because you... I, I mean, feel like you wasn't need it to know just that. like he he needed money and he needed a place to live? So. That is literally exactly right. The answer is in exchange for room and board. The other choices were things like he liked the daughter and wanted to get close to her. Ew. That's the reason maybe why the real life actor took the job. And then the other things are like just for money. He needed a job to make his parents get off his back. Of course, his dad's not around. We find that out throughout the series. Okay, number seven. How many episodes were aired in total? Got a head start on this uh, last time. Well, that's really funny because I, while you were doing the math on the last time, I was doing the math in my head and I came up with 100 because I was like, all right, four seasons of Powell's, tw about 25 a season. So it's going to be just like you said, that's about 100. So that was going to be my guess too. So I will take the close but not like, but not exact win. But this wants the whole series, including Oh, Pembroke's. it wants the whole series. Okay, sorry, I didn't hear that part. So you got to build on what we so already we learned. So we know 103, and so then we figure, you know, around 20 or 25, right? So 20 plus 20 would be 23, plus 5 more would be 28. So let's go 128. Very close. It's 126. You would have obviously gotten it if I had given you these 
options because some of them could you just imagine <laughs> the world that we could live in if, if the answer was number c episodes. 333 episodes of charles in charge or d 1000 episodes <laughs> of charles in charge oh you we would, could only dream do you understand that like the beginning part of our relationship like we would like it would never have ended i would be like no more charles i can't take it no it's quite the opposite we'd still be working through charles i know so, yeah that, that would be great. we would be so sick of him by now all right number eight which station did charles in charge appear on and i'm assuming this means the uh the first uh the first season before it was syndicated because i'm not going to say the choices are basically like your major networks as well as pbs okay nbc i find this surprising the answer is cbs okay charles ran on cbs and number nine is why was the first season canceled in 1985? Um, so this is another one where the answers might help shape what they're thinking of, but I think you could get the general idea. The ratings weren't good. Yeah. E due to struggle in ratings. <laughs> number uh, option C was the producers just up and left. <laughs> No, yes. option B was didn't have enough actors, actresses. <laughs> so, yep, no there's, one's around. No, there's no actors in Hollywood. We can't find anybody to be in the show. Mean, maybe there was one of those uh, SAG strikes or something around that time. <laughs> Final question. What state does the show take place in? We'll allow the uh, grammatically iffy uh, <laughs> wording there. In which state does this show take place? New Jersey. Yes, we all know, of course, that Charles lived in New Jersey. All right. This next segment is from our UFO sightings podcast. This was the one where Dick Van Dyke saw a UFO out of his office window and the dad from the Hogan family was flying a plane and he, he saw <laughs> right. a UFO. Yep. And yeah, this is going to be all about Charles and then uh, Walter, the grandpa, spotting the UFO and... Uh, we just might find out that a certain wacky friend had something to do with it. But, uh, yeah, you'll hear all that in this segment from the UFO podcast. Okay, moving on to Charles in Charge. I love the name of this episode. This Charles in Charge episode is called UF. Oh no! Yeah, <laughs> Charles in Charge looms large in this household, and this is going to be one of your classic episodes because it's all about like the farcical nature. It's all about like everybody running around, and you know, Adam thinks he's seen a UFO, and the girls think they've seen an alien, and you know, Grandpa's not having any of it. So yes, vintage Charles in Charge. Like I said at the beginning, this episode I think is one of the reasons why I think of this as a ubiquitous sitcom trope yeah well so um the episode starts like you said with um the youngest son what's his name adam adam he runs downstairs and he's like charles charles i just saw a ufo out my window come upstairs quick 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 and then and then the girls run in and they're like we just saw something hairy and furry run, run across the kitchen floor and then the grandpa comes in and he's like, what are my grandchildren talking about, Charles? Get them together because only people who have fuzzy thinking yes. talk about seeing aliens and UFOs. <laughs> this is my favorite phrase. This is just, this is grandpa's like call to arms. He doesn't like fuzzy thinking. And Charles says, oh, I don't consider Jamie and, uh, I don't consider Jamie and Sarah fuzzy thinkers. And yeah, they're just going to keep repeating that. And yeah, Stan Standard Charles and Charge setup where Grandpa just kind of blames Charles for anything that is happening. Right. Just he's if like, there's any trouble, this. yeah, the, it's Charles. That's what he's there for to stop this from happening. We get just like all of our other episodes, we get the mom giving Adam the sort of laundry list of alternate explanations. Right? Maybe yeah, it she's was like, a blimp. Don't be stressed out. I'll take you upstairs and put you to bed and tell you all the things that it. Could oh, be. that's right. This time we don't even get. The, it's it's almost like they know that we've seen these other episodes. Right. They're like, yada, yada, you don't need to hear it. We're just going to say off camera all of the different theories. 
We're going to have the same sort of dynamic ultimately as the other ones because Charles himself is going to see the UFO. And so he's going to go from the skeptic to the believer. Right. Now, did you catch, was this a Scott Vincent Bayo directed episode? It is not. Okay. We do see already though, Scott Bayo, like he's, he's, fancies himself this sort of physical comedian. Right. And, and this see, is kind of towards the end of season two. Yeah. So, but he's already got this sort of signature, like, manic run yes. that he does when he's, like, careening from from room to room, you know. And so, how does this play out? He's in the kitchen by himself. He, just, I think he goes into the kitchen to look for the furry animal that had been running around thinking that it must be a mouse or something like that. And they were like, well, if it's a mouse the size of a golden retriever and so he's looking for it and I can't remember if it was like that night that he sees it or if it was the next morning because we have these two scenes kind of back to back where then they're checking for the traps that grandpa had put out the next morning and the traps have all disappeared yeah and so he either sees the UFO prior to that or you know after that and he's in the kitchen and he looks up and there's all these kind of there's it's like flashing blue light and a little bit of a weird noise that I think is just for the audience because none of the characters who hear that noise react as though they're hearing that noise. So I yeah. think it might just be one of those sounds mm-hmm. meant for us. Non-diegetic music, right. if you will. Yes, if you will. <laughs> And so and so he see he looks out the window and he's doing the like frantic thing but now he's taking up space in front of the sink like whoa oh oh look up there kind yeah. of like Dick Van Dyke did when his whole acting was back to the camera face against a pane of glass Charles has to do the same thing and uh and he's just trying to take up space I mean obviously Dick Van Dyke does it better but you know Wow come on now <laughs> Uh, and yeah, and then he goes, he runs from the kitchen to the front door. That's where he does that signature farcical, you right. know, floppy run. You know, he does the kind of like, uh, you know, cartoon character thing of like overshooting it. And then yeah, it's like a dog and, trying to scoot around the corner where their butt keeps going. And they're like, whoa, 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 yeah, whoa, whoa. And then exactly. they, they get purchased and take off the other yeah. direction. So it's just funny that balance that he's trying to strike of being this like heartthrob with the unbuttoned shirt and the yes. little necklace and everything. Thing, but he's also like Mr. Silly, you know. Yes. But- well, and I noticed kind of right away that we didn't get a buddy entrance in like the first two scenes yeah. of the show. At first, normally, I was like, is Buddy on strike or something? Right. Like, is Buddy having a contract dispute? What's yeah. going on? Because no Buddy. But then I think it's like scene three or something. They're at the pizza place and he's like taking notes really badly as Charles is explaining oh, everything well, that's been going on. Yeah, that's that's going to get us our reveal. But before yeah. we get there, there are a few of these subtropes that just, you know, continue perfectly. We get Charles calling the observatory, right? Oh, that's right. We've of course got to... That was the see, next morning. And we get now, this isn't exactly the same sexual politics, but did you notice Charles on his one-sided phone call says, you know, he asks for the main scientist and then the person and must say like well that's not the proper nomenclature or whatever he goes what do you call the oh, man yeah. in charge right you know? he goes and then the side the, the guy who's talking to is like sir and yeah. he was like well can i speak to him but it's just so funny that we still haven't penetrated the uh haven't broken the glass ceiling of women well and we still don't when it comes scientists. to scientists right yeah. <laughs> but uh he he does that we get the thing of checking the newspapers to see if there's any mention of any ufo sightings yes. in the newspapers we get all the usual stuff and uh we get you know more conversations with grandpa about the fuzzy thinking we get charles reading ufos and you yes right, the hardcover book the book and then he just happened to have it on the shelf <laughs> yeah and before the um before the scene you're talking about where buddy reveals it grandpa has his own sighting we get a repeat thing oh that's right because that's like the next night right yeah yeah it's a multiple you know it's there are multiple and 
encounters. And yeah, I, I also just want to say it's clever the way this is the only one that does the sort of like multi-pronged facade where yes. it's like you can tell obviously from a mile away, oh, it's going to be, you know, there must have been a mouse loose or something. But it's fun to have all of the different characters have these different things they're reacting to. Adam saw something outside, whereas the girls saw something scoot across the floor. So it's all like adding up to this Yeah. Delusion. And then the traps disappear that Grandpa set. And then the next day, Grandpa sees the, you know, the same blue flashing yeah, yeah, lights same and everything looking out the window. And he calls Charles over and he's like, Charles, I saw it. And so then Grandpa decides, well, we've got to call the press. Yeah. Like if nobody else has seen this, we need to get the word out. Yeah, yeah. He says, uh, they'll have to believe me. I have a witness, right? That's right? Very quaint notion that you have one other person that nobody's ever heard of to corroborate you your story. You guys have both seen and, this and you live in the same house. And so they've scheduled this this news meeting. And yeah, that's when... Yeah, an we, interview with a local reporter. Yeah, this it's yeah standard sort of sitcom thing. Oh, of course, the local news guy is going to come to our house and local interview us here. Local news woman. Yes. And And uh, yeah, we have that scene that you were talking about where at the pizza shop, you know, Charles and Buddy are talking. Charles is just kind of like, you know, explaining the situation. All the craziness that's been happening. Buddy's asking very weird questions. Like at first they're kind of innocuous, just like what's going on, you know, with all the with, you know, the sightings at home. And then he's like, would you say you were relatively scared, very scared, not not at all scared or none of the above. Yeah. And I was like, but did you notice how he's like supposedly taking notes on this piece of paper, but his pen never moves from the top <laughs> of the pad. And he's like, I see and looks down and doesn't even like pretend like doesn't even pretend to write just kind of wiggles his finger in the same place, almost as though like we're not almost as though the the aspect ratio was off and we're seeing more of the scene than we should. Yeah. Or almost as though they He's just didn't actor. bother to do anything <laughs> correctly. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it's very funny. He's asking him, like you said, these sort of questionnaire style questions. And then when Charles goes, what are you doing over there with that book, buddy? Yeah, that he goes, pad. <laughs> yeah, he goes, oh, I'm just doodling. And Charles goes, doodling my foot. And Buddy goes, no, mostly I do nudes. Right? <laughs> Class Sick, Charles in charge, humor. Um, and then, yeah, it comes out that this was all a psychological experiment that Buddy has been running on the Powell household. Right. He has he, been staging this. Exactly. He set up the lights and the like UFO thing so that they would see it. Then he could have something to write about for his psychology paper. Well, Charles is like, we got to get back to the house. You know, Mr. Powell's about to give this interview with the newspaper or with the TV. He's going to be a laughing stock. We have to stop him. Yes. And it's just funny how this experiment that Buddy has done, you know, I was thinking how similar the staging of this all was, the Charles in charge to the Dick Van Dyke, the looking out the window and everything. And yeah, he's done everything you would need to convince us, the audience, that there was an alien, you know, right. rigged up lights and sounds and whatnot. Nothing that would actually convince Charles and Mr. Powell, like somebody who is actually there, who could walk out right. a and few see feet and investigate what it this. was. Yeah. Mm. Well, so I guess at some point between the pizza place or maybe when we get back to the house, Buddy and Charles are still talking and we realize he only rigged it up to happen that well, one Well, that's night. the very last. That's, oh, the, that's the very end. That's the okay. fun little tag at the end. But we first, also we have find to save out, Grandpa. Yeah, first we have to save. But, but we also find out that he didn't do anything with like a furry little creature running around. Right. That's because we get a separate reveal for that one. Yeah. It's Frederick, Kevin Holloway's hamster. Kevin Holloway is the often mentioned best friend of Adam. Yes, and he's your Socko. He's yes. your standard off-camera character. We never, ever meet him. We do meet his mean big brother yeah. at some point. But yeah, the whole family kind of ends up, you know, this this reporter has showed up at the house. Yeah. Uh, Mr. Powell's about to do this interview. He's waiting for Charles to corroborate. And Charles is like, whoa, 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 whoa. just everybody, don't do anything yet. Mr. Powell, I have to talk to you first. But then everybody gets sidetracked by the gerbil and the... 
Yeah, they the find thing. the guinea pig, or yeah. they find the the hairy alien, and it turns out it's Frederick, like right. you so said. So that part's solved. So then he finally gets a moment to like talk to Mr. Powell and is like, this was an experiment. Buddy yeah. was doing, was writing a psych paper. And, you know, Grandpa's like, Lem back! <laughs> yeah, he's like, what am I going to do? I'm going to be humiliated. Like, there, you know, I've invited this reporter over. And Charles and Mr. Powell agree to sync the story with banality. They right, say, let's make just it make so it boring, boring and unbelievable, but unbelievable in a way that's not even new newsworthy and it's just going to be they're just going to consider it a waste of time if we say yeah i saw some lights and my italian male housekeeper he saw them too <laughs> and uh yeah and so it'll be no fuss no muss you know yeah, they probably nothing, won't come over yeah, next time nothing to to hear and we've had buddy stalling the reporter for all this time yeah being very obnoxious and saying all of these buddy things so she is itching to leave yeah and so they do their their uh, interview, I guess. It ends with the button of Charles and Buddy having that conversation. I feel like this is a fun, you know, they love to do this. Even yes. in the movies, even in horror movies, they'll do this. We vanquish the bad guy, or did we? You right. know, we solved the, the ghost, but maybe not. And uh, yeah, in this case, you know, Charles is, is kind of reviewing the whole sequence of events. And Buddy is like, I only rigged that stuff up for one night and it's just your standard sort of Ooh, yeah. what really happened <laughs> maybe there was an alien and yeah it's and a grandpa fun... would have been the one who really saw it because he's the only one that saw it on that second night yeah yeah and this uh, yeah it's it's fun in that farcical way and it's it's almost like it's it's a fun way to sort of build upon the trope you know, the way it was presented in those first few ones. Like I said, they, they actually make it a little more sort of complicated by adding the extra elements of the different people spotting different sort of alien evidence. And uh, yeah, I don't know. Look, it's Charles in charge. It's right. not great. But I've always I've considered this always one of the more fun episodes for that reason. Yeah, I feel like everybody gets a little bit of something. Everybody gets a zinger. Everybody gets to, you know, we find out Sarah is the one who got rid of the traps because even though she didn't want the alien in quotes in the house she didn't yeah, want it to obviously. be killed and so you know everybody gets a little bit of a moment even the mom who's like never in the show yeah. gets a little bit of a moment so it a is little it's a, a little bit of one but it's a good i mean it's a good all-around ensemble moment for the show yeah charles at his best <laughs> All right, so that was all of the Charles in Charge conversations we have had so far in the year and a half we've been doing this. I wonder show. how many times across those episodes did we get to hear your little, like, sheepish, guilty pleasure voice <laughs> when talking about Charles. It's probably four times that I've, exp five times, including this new part where I've explained <laughs> this little thesis of how it's a family sitcom that only focuses on the kids and all that. But yeah, just looking at these four episodes that we covered uh, is there any that stand out to you as like oh those that was the best one or that was the most ridiculous or, or anything like that um, I, de I mean the Bonked in the Head new personality was so wild and wacky I mean that was one of the ones that we when we were first talking about this podcast that that was like oh we have to do an episode like that because there's so many funny episodes of television episodes sitcom episodes where this thing happens yes. and charles like was one of them on our minds yes you know? that is a true uh, exactly right Th those sitcom tropes that are part of the whole concept of our show that it's like this literally never happens it is impossible <laughs> it is based on the most you know but it always happens on tv <laughs> yeah exactly but they feel the need to do these ridiculous stories again and again and yes that one was burned into my brain and the ufo one and the makeover one honestly are kind of similar like they were definitely on my mind when we started fleshing out this idea of oh what if we pick a trope and then follow all the sitcoms and stuff you know like i said before because this show is so seminal to me and i watched the those reruns again and again, 
just that notion of like, oh, of course, aliens. Everybody thinks there's aliens or some stupid makeover story. And it turns out that, you know, she just had to be herself or whatever it was like those things. Yeah, it's like full house, saved by the bell and stuff. But Charles in charge in some way, for the reasons we said already, it, it's the most silly and zany while still sort of posing as like, oh, no, we're, we're just like family ties. Yeah, we're, we're, we're just not a, a family Saturday sitcom. morning show. Yeah, we're, exactly. we're a real sitcom. Yeah. Exactly. So, Charles, we salute you. We love you. You've done nothing well. wrong ever. <laughs> and, uh, yep, we'll be back with a regular episode next week. Until then, we will consider this segment of the sitcom study concluded. Thank you for listening to The Sitcom Study. Tell us what you think or share your own TV tropes and topic ideas by sending a self-addressed stamped email to sitcomstudypodcast at gmail.com or find us on Facebook or Instagram. And if you like the show, consider leaving a rating or review on your podcast app. It helps us boost those precious Nielsen ratings. The Sitcom Study is recorded in front of a live studio dog. Studio dog.